found a caterpillar. He found a fluffy milkweed pod and blew out all the filler. A bird's nest in a tree overhead, so wisely placed up so high, was just another wonder that caught his eager eye. A neighbor watched his zigzag course and hailed him from the lawn, asked him where he'd been that day and what was going on. I've been to Bible school, he said, and turned a piece of sod. He picked up a wiggly worm, replying, I've learned a lot about God. Hmm, very fine way, the neighbor said, for a boy to spend his time. If you tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, the answer came, nor were his accents faint. I'll give you a dollar, mister, if you can tell me where God ain't. So today we're going to be talking about the names of God in the Old Testament primarily. If you noticed, uh, most or all of our songs this morning were using words like Jehovah and Adonai, and there's a, there a bunch of them in the Old Testament. I narrowed it down. I won't tell you how many because you might get restless, but I think it's, it's real important that we know the, the, the names that were used for God back in the Old Testament. Uh, a name was not only an identification, like, you know, my name is Joe, your name is Nancy, your name is, you know, whatever, but it was also an identity. Back then, the names were very meaningful, where now it just seems like we, we try to make them meaningful. I know when, before we named Josh and before I named Jill and how they ended up with those names, Josh was supposed to be Timothy, but when he was born, he didn't look like a Timothy. I'm sorry. And Jill, we weren't sure what she was going to be, but we, we ended up calling her Jill. But we did research the names. For those of you that have had children, you've probably gone through this. And maybe your name has a real deep, you know, meaning that your mother gave to you. But back, back in, the, in the, those days, back in the Old Testament days, that was a big thing. Many times a special meaning was attached to the name. Names had, among other purposes, an explanatory purpose. Throughout Scripture, God reveals himself to us through his names. I mean, a lot of times we'll say either God or we'll say Jesus. But, you know, there was a whole bunch of names that were translated that way into some of our songs and so on. But there's a lot of names that actually uh, were used for God. Throughout Scripture, God reveals himself through his names. When we study these names that he reveals to us in the Bible, we will better understand who God really is. And isn't that what we really want? We really want to know who God is this morning. Amen. The meanings behind God's names reveal the central personality and nature of the one who bears them. So who is God to you? Is he your most high God? All-sufficient one, master, Lord of peace, the Lord who will provide, is he your father? We must be careful not to make God into an it or a thing to which we pray. How many know that's sometimes easy to do? He's not in it. He's not a thing. He's a person. God knows us by our name. Shouldn't we know him by his? And I like the fact that, you know, if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, which I do, and hopefully everyone in here does, God revealed himself through the people that penned those, those words so we could get a better understanding of who God was. What are the different names of God and what do they mean? Now, like I said, this is primarily going to be Old Testament, and I'm not going to dwell on them real, really long, but there's a bunch of them. So if you're taking notes, or if you're not, we'll have them up on a PowerPoint here, and they'll come up one at a time. Each of the many names God describes a different aspect of his many-faceted character. Here are some of the better-known ones, and I only picked, well, I won't tell you how many, but I picked a few, <laughs> because I didn't want to be here all day, but I think I picked the most important ones. The very first one is El Shaddai. In the Old Testament, El Shaddai occurs only seven times. El, and it means, El is another name that is translated as God. So anytime you see E-L, that means God. And can be used in conjunction with other words. So in this case, it's El, God, and Shaddai, which means Lord God Almighty. So that's what El Shaddai means. This refers to God completely nourishing, satisfying, and supplying his people with all their needs as a mother would. Connected with the, the word for God, El denotes a God who freely gives nourishment and blessing. He is our sustainer. 
Amen. Number two, El Elyon. And that means the Most High God. In the Old Testament, El Elyon occurs 28 times. And it, it occurs 19 times in Psalms by itself. Elyon literally means Most High and is used both objectively and substantially throughout the Old Testament. It expresses his extreme sovereignty and majesty of God and his highest preeminence. So that's El Elyon, the Most High. Number three, and here's the one we were just singing about, Adonai. How many of you knew what Adonai meant? We sort of knew it was God, right? Or else we wouldn't be singing about it. But it actually means Lord or Master. And in the Old Testament, it occurs 434 times. That's quite a bit. Adonai is the verbal parallel to Yahweh and Jehovah, which we're going to get into here shortly. Adonai is plural. The singular is Adon. In reference to God, the plural Adonai is always used. And that was used first in Genesis 15.2. He said, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And when he said, Lord God, he was using the word Adonai. How many of you knew that there were a whole bunch of different gods that they, you know, the name for God that they were using? Some people just think that, you know, it was God, God, or Jehovah, Jehovah, Je the, the names meant so much that they were used in different references and different scriptures. Number four, and this, this, is a, this is a big one here, Yahweh. Yahweh was used in the Old Testament, it occurs 6,519 times. That name is used more than any name in the entire Bible. And for those of you that didn't know, uh, the actual spelling of it is Y-H-W-H. -H. And that comes, there were no vowels in there. And they used to call that, if, if, this is a big word, tetragrammation, which meant four, four letters. And it was such a sacred, sacred name that people wouldn't even repeat it because they were... You know, it was just that holy. I'm going to read a little bit here. It comes from the Hebrew letters Yud, He, Vav, and He. Yahweh was first used in Genesis 2. The modern spelling as Yahweh includes vowels so that we can pronounce it. It's sort of like, I know when I worked for Ericsson years ago, they were a Swedish company. And for those of you that have ever been around any Swedish people, their names have no vowels, a lot of them. So you're trying to pronounce their name, you know, G-R-D-W-S-K, yeah, it, was, it was weird. Yahweh was sort of like that. There were no, there were no vowels involved. So it was, it was a very, very holy thing. The fifth one I have here is Jehovah Nisi. And Jehovah Nisi means the Lord, my banner. In the Old Testament, Jehovah Nisi occurs only once. And that's in Exodus 1715 the Lord my banner and by the way the, the word Jehovah means the existing one or Lord I thought that was pretty interesting Jehovah is translated as the existing one or Lord the chief meaning of Jehovah is derived from the Hebrew word Hava meaning to be or to exist it also suggests to become or specifically to become known this denotes God who reveals himself unceasingly. And that was found first in Exodus 17, 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner. So, so far we have five. Number six, Jehovah Ra. And that means the Lord, my shepherd. It's used in the Old Testament. It's used once, I believe, in Psalm 23, 1. And those of you that have ever been to a funeral have probably heard Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the word that they're using in that, in that psalm. Number seven is Jehovah Rapha. And that means the Lord who heals. It's used in the Bible in Exodus 15, 28. Number eight, Jehovah Shammah. That means the Lord is there. It's used in the Bible in the Old Testament only once in Ezekiel 48, 35. Shama is derived from a Hebrew word sham, which can be translated as there. In other words, the Lord is there. So we could say Jehovah Shama for here, because the Lord is here. Amen. 
Number nine, Jehovah, this is a tough one, Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu. It only occurs twice, and that means the Lord our righteousness. It's first used in Jeremiah 23, 6. It means to be stiff or to be straight or righteous in Hebrew. When the two words are combined, Jehovah Tzidkenu, it can be translated, the Lord who is our righteousness. I think this was really interesting, the, the way all these different words, you know, when they call me, I, I'm, well, I take that back. I was going to say most people just call me Joe. But, you know, remember that thing used to be, you can call me Ray or you can, you know. But, you know, people call me a, a lot of different names, probably names I don't want to know. But I think this is very interesting that, that the, the scholars back then actually had individual names for God to, to bring forth what they were trying to talk about. In other words, the healer and so on and so forth. Number 10, Jehovah Mequadosh, the Lord who sanctifies you. It's used in the Bible two times. It's first used in Exodus 31, 13. And that derives from the Hebrew word quadosh, meaning sanctify, holy, or dedicate. And how many of you know what the definition of sanctify means? Sanctify is the separation of an object or person to be dedicated to the holy, or to the Lord. When the two words are combined, it can be translated as the Lord who sets you apart. How many of you feel like you're set apart? How many of you think we should be feeling like we're set apart? We try to become, you know, part of this world, and the world has entered so much into the church. Uh, you know, I don't believe it was ever meant to be that way. I believe that we were supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be like the world. We should have more of an influence on the world than we're having right now. But that's a whole other issue we're not going to get into. There's only a few more, guys, so hang in there. Number 11, El Olam. And that means the everlasting God. Remember, El is another word for God. It can be used in conjunction with other words to designate various aspects of God. So El Olam can be translated as the eternal God. Now, here's one of my favorites. Elohim. I many of you remember that? That's, that's way back in Genesis 1.1. That means God, judge, or creator. It occurs over 2,000 times in the Bible. Elohim. And how many of you knew that, that Elohim is plural? That means, you know, it's not just one, it's, it's more. So that's, that's one of the, the, the points that some cults will use. They'll say, well, there's more than one God. It's not just because they use the word Elohim. Uh, but it, as Christians, we believe it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's translated as God. The derivation of the name Elohim is debatable to most scholars. Some believe it is derived from El, which we talked about earlier, which is the root word. Others think that Elohim is derived from another two words in conjunction with Eloah, and still others presume they come from Eloah, a different spelling, E-L-O-A-H. And we all know the, the, the verse, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Number 13, Kana, and that means jealous. In the Old Testament, Kana occurs six times. Isn't that a strange one to be calling God jealous? How many of you ever remember the scriptures in there where it says the God, the God is a jealous God? Why do you think he's jealous? Probably because he doesn't want anybody else taking up our attention. So this day and age, I believe God is pretty jealous. There's so much in this world that, that, uh, that is taking up our time that we should be spending on the Lord. And I, I believe that right now God is definitely jealous. In Exodus 20... Verse 5, it says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Number 14. This one you've probably heard. We used to play a song. It's called Jehovah Jireh. And that means the Lord will provide. That only occurs one time. And it's in Genesis 22:14. Jehovah Jireh is a symbolic name given to Mount Moriah by Abraham to memorialize, memorialize the intercession of God in the sacrifice of Isaac by providing a substitute 
for the imminent sacrifice of his son. That's Gen Genesis 22, 14. Number 15, Jehovah Shalom. Everybody knows what that one is, I'll bet. That means the Lord is peace. It occurs only once, and it's in Judges 6, 24. Shalom is a derivative of shalem, which means to be complete or sound. Shalom is translated as peace or absence from strife. Wow. How much we need Jehovah Shalom today. And the very last one, Jehovah Sabaoth. That means the Lord of hosts. That occurs 285 times in the Bible, so that's quite a bit also. Hosts, how many of you know what a host is? You, sometimes you hear about the heavenly hosts. It's an army. So he's the, he, the, he is the Lord of the armies. So in summary, I'm going to go through these just one at a time, just so we remember them. First, we talked about El Shaddai, and that was Lord God Almighty. Then we talked about El Elyon, which we're going to be singing about here at the end here. That means the Most High God. Then we talked about Adonai, which was Lord or Master. We talked about Yahweh that was used 6,519 times, which meant Lord. Then we said Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. It also means the Lord my miracle. I mean, if you need Jehovah Nisi right now, I know I could use him. Then we said Jehovah Ram, the Lord my shepherd. And Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Shamya, the Lord is there. Jehovah Tzitainu, the Lord over righteousness. Jehovah Mekwadosh, the Lord who sanctifies you. El Olam, the everlasting God. Elohim, God, judge, creator. That's the one that was used over 2,000 times. Kwanah, which meant jealous. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. And Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. So if we take all those and, and, and take out the Lord is, the Lord is, how about if it sounds like this? So if we're trying to describe somebody, if I was going to try to describe Tom, I better watch what I say here, huh, Tom? What, what would we say about Tom? We would say, well, Tom is intelligent. He's rambunctious. <laughs> he's caring. He's humble. Those are words that I would use you know, to describe Tom. Uh, other people that I know, I would use you know, different terms. Uh, so, if we were going to describe our God, I, I took the meanings of all those words, so we would say this, so, God is almighty, most high, he's my Lord, he's my master, he's my miracle working God. God is my shepherd, who heals me, and is always there. God is my righteousness, who sanctifies and makes me holy. God is everlasting, my God, my judge, and my creator. God is jealous. My God provides and gives me peace. He's the Lord of hosts. He's my redeemer, my deliverer, my conqueror. Wow, what a way to describe somebody, huh? How would you like somebody to describe you like that? In other words, I got to thinking about this. In other words, God is my hero. Amen? I would like to just be like him. What is a hero? A person... And remember, God is a person. He's not an it. He's not a thing. He's not something up there floating around. A hero is a person who is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. I think God fills all those bills. You know, I got to thinking about what some of our heroes are this day and age. And really, if you, if you really think about it, I would say most of our worldly heroes are... I hate to use this word, but I'm going to use it our joke. I mean, we, we talk about some of our heroes as football players, baseball players, hockey players, NASCAR drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you really, really believe that they are heroes when you compare them to God? I don't.
The other thing that, that I, th this is just off the record, I guess. The, the other thing that I, I sometimes get um, disturbed about is when, when people use the word, like I'll be talking to somebody and, and I'll say, you know, give me a, a hot dog and, and a Coke. And oh, that's awesome, they'll say. And I'll say, what? I don't like to use the word awesome except if I'm referring to God. That's just me, a little pet peeve of mine. I believe there's only one thing in this entire universe that's awesome, and that's God Almighty. I think awesome has been used way too much. I think Satan, this is my personal opinion, you don't have to receive this if you don't want to, Satan has dimmed our vision and blocked our ears from what God really is and who God really is and from what God can really do. We put our focus on so many things. You know, our... <laughs> I don't want to go there with the cell phone, Lord, but how many of you, well, I don't even have to ask. I'd say 99% of the people in here have the cell phone, have a cell phone in there or texting or whatever. And just so much of our time, so much of our time is distracted by those things. And I believe, and I, I'm not saying they're demonic. I'm not saying anything like that, but I'm just saying anything, anything that distracts us away from the Lord is not good. Would you agree with that? It's fun. It's entertaining. And in my personal opinion, it's addicting. Uh, it's funny because if, if you talk to, uh, you know, s some of the older generation, you know, 60s and up, which I'm part of at this point, um, they could care less about texting. They could care less about a cell phone. They could care less about any of that stuff. They like direct contact. How many of you noticed that? I really enjoy speaking with elderly people because you can actually carry on a conversation with them where most people you can't. You know, a lot of the, the, the younger, and I'm not picking on old or young or whatever, but they don't know how to complete a sentence face to face. If it isn't texted, if it isn't abbreviated, if, if there isn't an emoji or a picture or something going out, and I'm not saying good, bad, or otherwise, I'm just saying it, it's such a, it's one of those, ah, it's just so nice to talk to somebody for a change instead of beep, 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 you know, fill it up, beep, 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 you know, you're watching TV, beep, 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 you know, it's just on and on and on. How many of you experience that on a daily basis? <laughs> How many of you can't get out of that trap? How many of you know that an addiction is the same way? People say, ah, I can quit smoking anytime I want to. I don't know if for any of those of you, you were, that were ever smokers. And then when you actually try to do it, it's not that easy, is it? Same with if, you're, if you drink, if you take drugs, if, you know, I have some friends that are on drugs that uh, you know, I tell them that. You know, you need to get off. Yeah, I can get off anytime I want to. I don't want to. No, they can't. I challenge you, and I, and I don't know why I'm even saying this. I challenge you for one day, turn your phone off. Just turn your phone. Turn it off on a Sunday. When we leave here today, you don't have to do this. So, you know, but I'm, I'm just.